twenty four hours of training to use, and we wanted to make something fast where we could send teams down with like fifteen minutes of training that they could use the CMR. And so this first iteration was terrible. The database was completely denormalized. The software architecture was in shambles. So we scrapped it and we started a whole new one. Um, and then after that, we started Team Femur, which is a nonprofit here in Michigan. And that's kind of based on these transient medical teams that go in and out of these very underserved regions. They, um, the, the trips are not sustainable. They don't record any information on the patients that they see. They don't know how to share. They can't share with the, the patients in one area two different teams that go to that area, they can't share data between the teams because they don't record any of it. And they don't know what medications to bring next time, etc. cetera. Um, the local economy gets a little disrupted because these American teams give free health care, whereas some of the local hospitals don't really like that because it takes away from their business. Um, same with the local pharmacies. And that gives these teams a bad perception. If there's one thing we learned from talking to these people, it's that they, I don't want to say hate, but they don't really like these Americans coming in and doing this all the time because it takes away from their business basically. So we're trying to change that with the CMR. We want to get these teams to use it. We want to get them to communicate and talk to each other. Um, so this, uh, I'm trying to understand. So you're working at Ford. Yeah. And you decided to come into the Michigan uh, Metro Detroit Linux user group to, to talk about this uh, because you're you're interested in what getting more people involved in doing the open source part of this, or is it you know you're, you've got some interest in getting some customers locally to start using the medical software in, in medical practices? You know, I guess what, what how can we help you? What is it we're trying to accomplish? It's a little bit of both. Um, obviously, being open source, you try to build a community around what you're doing. That's how you have an impact with your software. Um, in terms of using it locally, we haven't had any of that yet. Um, it has been used in transient teams, working in underserved areas, um, and bringing it home to use, you run into a lot of very strict HIPAA laws, which we're trying to tackle right now. It's a little bit of both. <laughs> um, and a little bit of more background on the software. It's, it's a responsive web application. We decided we didn't really want to uh, design it in Android or iOS. We just wanted to make it a web application because nowadays that means all you have to do is hook up your smartphone or your tablet, whatever the teams bring they can use on this on the system. And it's kind of unique in that we can't just make software and push it out there and say, hey, we've got an EMR, use it. Because these people are working in areas that don't have internet, don't have power, don't have anything at all. So we have to be kind of innovative in how we deploy this where they go. Um, so network infrastructure is pretty important. I had to kind of learn about how networks work, and that's not really my background, but it was fun. Um, we started, when we started the software, we used the MIT license, which is extremely permissive in the sense that the open source code that you write can be used in proprietary software and then sold, and you don't have to change, you don't have to share the source code. But with, uh, with GNU's general public license, they actually lock that down. So if anybody takes this code and changes it and distributes it, it has to remain open source. And so we changed over the GPL, and I really like that. Um, I assume everybody here knows what GNU stands for, right? Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, the might not know what WSU is on the yep. internet here. So, so uh, the, it became a really tight collaboration between Wayne State's Computer Science Department and Wayne State's School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, the School of Medicine has been going to this one location. They've been taking our EMR. They piloted it when it was in its early stages. They saw it fail. They saw it not work. And so they came back, and we changed it, and we sent them with it again. So they've been really, really co cooperative with that. And we finally got it working, and it's, it's awesome. And with the computer science department, we've been getting about three or four students every year in the capstone course, which I think you said you were in the computer science department. Um, and It's coming up for me. Yep, there you go. So we may run into each other at that point. Um, so the students come in and they work, they work on this open source software and, and they produce features for us and, and it's actually used in Haiti. So um, keeping this in Wayne State has been really, really important as well. Um, moving on, here's a, a screenshot of the most basic screen, which is the medical screen. Um, it's kind of fun because uh, Everybody who works on this, you know, you have to make test data, so you can you can make up really really funny things. And starting with this, I I didn't know what a normal blood pressure was. I had no idea. I didn't know that like it was good to have a heart rate of 70 or 100. I had no clue. <laughs> but now now you start to learn these things, and so the the EMR is divided into a couple sections on the top. It's hard to see on here, um, but 
you have the nurses and the physicians and the pharmacists, and then there's a research section where the doctors can actually come in and analyze the data and see what they've done. <clears throat> um, each patient gets a unique identifier so that they can always be identified with that number. So uh, you're, you're saying that, you know, a database, right? So, could you, I mean, maybe give us a little more technical understanding. So you're basically go wanting... Into, okay, all right. I'm so going to get pretty technical. I, I thought you would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yep, I'll definitely do that. So the Wayne State School of Medicine, they go to one location in Haiti, and as of last year, there's two groups out of Detroit that have been going to the same location. And we've seen this as an opportunity to kind of get two groups using it in the same spot and collaborating and using the data together. Um, a little bit about Haiti real quick. Uh, they've got a 53% literacy rate. This is important because half of the people don't know how to even read. And so when they come to you one week and they tell you that their name is Joseph, and they come to you next week and they spell it completely differently, that's normal there. And so we can't always look them up by the same name every time. They don't even know their birthday sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's been a real challenge to try to identify these patients and keep them in the same encounters. 59% of the population has less than $2.44 a day. A family of four lives in a room that's smaller than this, probably about half the size of this. Um, they have a power grid in Haiti, um, but it's only in the port where you fly in, and you can hardly call it, call it a power grid because like once an hour the power goes out. We stayed there at an orphanage one night and they had a generator backup still because it doesn't really work. But if there's one thing that Haiti does well, it's that they make really good rum and really good coffee. And when you mix the two, it's even better. <laughs> and so this, um, this was a picture that I took. And with all that being said, the country's, like, the scenery is just stunning. This is, it's incredible. Um, and I took this picture, and, and if, you, if you turn around and do a 180, this is, it's hard to see up here, but this is where we slept. So it was really cool. We had mosquito nets to try to protect us from any... Turn off lights? Uh, maybe. Better. I've got a couple of pictures coming up before I get into the technical stuff, so. Yeah, I think it's probably too dark. Yeah, it's way too dark. Too dark for the camera. Well, I mean, we can see your, but. <laughs> um, well, anyway, so you turn around, and this is where we slept. We had this little satellite here, and it would go out and get a satellite connection to like the slowest internet connection you could ever imagine. Just enough to be able to come and sit in this corner and send out like a message on Hangouts or WhatsApp really quick. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the, the mosquito nets protected us, um, and so our goal here, right, was that these two teams are going to this place and they're consistently having trouble getting a Wi-Fi connection set up. Um, and so there's little to no infrastructure, um, unknown variables in the environment. You can't just call them and say, hey, I need a generator and like five gallons of gas on this date at this time, because that's just not how things work there. Um, so we get down there and we did end up securing a generator um, and some gas, which now sits in this town. Um, and we, I had no idea what the building looked like when I went down there. So while doing my networking research, I found out about this really, really awesome technology called Power Over Ethernet, mm -hmm. where you can actually inject power into the Ethernet cord. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so my, my, my thought process then was, all right, just throw like 600 feet of Ethernet cable in my suitcase and let's make this happen, right? <laughs> so I did that. Um, and then we went down there and we threw all our luggage in this blue, blue truck. It drove us up the mountain. We had two security guys sitting on top to make sure nobody stole anything. They unloaded us here. Um, and this was the path. This is the clinic. That white tent there at the end is where the nurses saw the patients. And then they'd walk all the way down this pathway into the clinic. And you can see kind of on the top here, a little power over Ethernet cord running <laughs> all the way down there <laughs> into, the, into the little triage area. Um, and that's the clinic at the end of that pathway. So once you walk down here, you get to this. Mm -hmm. and. It was, uh, the, t the roof was destroyed in the earthquake in 2010, um, so they didn't see any patients on the second floor, and that's kind of where we set up shop with the generator and, uh, and our server. And then we had all the little power over ethernet cords coming out there. So we sat up there for a week and kind of watched everybody do stuff and look at all the data that was coming. It was pretty cool. Um, and those, I put those bags over the router and um, the router and the, the power over ethernet injectors to stop the like 110 degree heat from melting them. <laughs> wow. So, there's another view from that. That power of Ethernet was a lifesaver. Um, it worked out very well. I was able to power the access points at every every spot. Um, there it is. 600. I think I got about a 600 foot radius. It was an ubiquity access point, and it's just strictly over power over Ethernet. The little kid's name is Vadner, and he couldn't speak English at all. He could say picture, and that was about it. But I taught him how to use the. Um, I brought a, a network. Um, 
at like an end-to-end -end Ethernet tester, you have like two remotes, one Ethernet cord goes in one, and the other Ethernet cord goes in the other. You turn it on, I think there's six or eight pins in the Ethernet cords, and it lights up each one as it realizes there's a, a legit connection. So we were having problems initially where some access points would go down, <clears throat> and I couldn't figure out why on the first day. And so I, 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 I taught this kid how to use it. And so I would, I would have him sit at the triage area testing the, the Ethernet cord while I was sitting up here. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was pretty awesome. <laughs> And uh, we were able to, um, by the way, that problem I was having was because the access points were operating on the same channels. And so when they would see each other, one would just drop. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. But, uh, and so finally, it was really cool. We were able to measure, um, we were able to get data on this population of people who have never really been monitored before. We've never been able to see, like, these groups go in and they come out. And they take some paper records, but those invariably, they'll get lost. <clears throat> So we haven't had any data. And we were able to now see how many are male, how many are female, their ages, you know, what kind of problems they had. Um, and that means that other groups who go to this area can also see what the problems they have. <clears throat> so on to the fun stuff. Um, <laughs> so some of the technologies we use. For the web, we use the Play Framework, which is a mixture of uh, Java and Scala. It's, um, and I'll go more into that after. For version control, we use Git. We do everything through GitHub. Um, the server runs Linux. And of course, my favorite power of Ethernet. It's still the coolest thing. Um, so we chose, we chose the Play framework because at Wayne State, they teach us C and C++. And we sat down, and at the time, there was um, there's a lot of different frameworks out there, right? There's a lot of JavaScript coming out. There's a lot of all different kinds of stuff happening. And we figured that C Sharp and Java were the two best alternatives because nobody wants to write a web framework in C++. You'd have to be a little crazy, I think. Um, but Java is easily accessible from somebody that knows C++. It's also cross-platform, so you can write it in Linux, OS X, or Windows. And at the time, C Sharp had not been open sourced yet. So we just kind of ruled out C Sharp and went with the Play Framework, which supports Java. It has a build tool, a Scala build tool. So actually all of the Java code, you can write Scala or Java, they, they both run on the same platform, so they're interchangeable. Um, the languages are exactly the same and you can pile them into each other. So 